G'day and welcome to the Prezzo Show. My name is Mark Presley, but my friends call me Prezzo. Now, I'm a retired industrial technology teacher, and over 35 years I taught young people all about woodworking, metalworking, and graphics, which is a form of technical drawing. And now, in my retirement, I still love doing all of those things that I taught young people in my own home workshop. So I love working with wood, metal, machines, CAD, CAM, 3D printing, I do the lot. <laughs> So uh, I've got an exciting project to share with you today, so let's have a detailed look at what I have in mind. Here's a very quick look at what we're talking about today. This is a seven segment display digital clock, and it's based on a design that I saw on YouTube, and it was a gentleman named Leon Vandenbuchel who first published what I saw and wanted to be able to replicate. And I made two of these clocks, uh, probably, what was it, last year, the year before, and uh, I call them a Vixi clock and the reason for that is that they use a very thin sheet of veneer as the diffuser over the surface of the seven segment display. And uh, in this particular clock I'm going to use a slightly different uh, version of that diffuser. So what I've got here is a piece of clear acrylic that's been sandblasted on the back and that's going to sit over the top of this 3D printed seven segment uh, skeleton. And then over the top of that again, we're going to use a piece of stainless steel mesh. And uh, you'll see in a minute why I'm going to use mesh. <laughs> uh, we're looking for a particular design aesthetic in this project. So let's have a look at what I have in mind. Okay, this is just a paper render of the design. I've already got this model in my 3D CAD program. And I've got a full set of detailed drawings. And uh, these are going to allow me to cut and make the individual parts. Now you're looking at this and you're saying, wow, that's, uh, that's steampunk. Well, yeah, it is. It's sort of a mashup of steampunk, art deco, industrial uh, type aesthetic. Here's the clock module in the centre here with its stainless steel mesh over the surface of it. And it's sitting in a wooden frame, which is cylindrical with a pocket cut out on the front and the back the back pocket will be for a switch panel. We've got some copper tubing to support the whole thing and that's important because we're going to run a wire up from the bottom of the clock to the inside to power the clock itself. We've got some metal cast parts on the ends and the base. The top part here is a sort of a, a bit of a, a nod to steam technology. Uh, this is normally called a steam dome on a steam boiler and its job is to, uh, to collect the dry steam and then deliver that to the engine or whatever device it's running. We've got a thing that looks like pressure gauge but it's actually a thermometer and on this side here we've got this purely whimsical piece of decoration which I'm calling a discombobulator. <laughs> now it will have an LED in the base which will shine up through this glass tube here and that will be powered from the inside of the clock. So lots and lots of parts to make and this is going to be a multi-part series, I uh, can't cover it all today. And we're going to begin with the wooden frame. So I've got some material that we're going to use. This stuff here is called New Guinea Rosewood. And it's a nice material to work with, it's got a, an interesting colour and grain. Uh, the only downside of this is it's very open grain, but uh, we can work around that. So let's head next door to the wood shop and let's start cutting up the material to make that wooden frame. Now I'm not sure if I mentioned this before but I'm actually making two separate clocks in this build. And this one stick of timber here, which is all I've got, has to be enough to make both those timber frames. So I'm going to start off by breaking this down into three individual lengths and I'll get that thickness to two different thicknesses and then we'll break it down further to make the individual parts for each frame. Now, I don't own a jointer, so those saw cuts that I just did there were to give me one relatively straight edge on each board. And what we need to do now is get these through the thicknesser to bring them to their final dimension. Just 
before I put this through the thickness I want to be sure that these boards aren't severely cupped or twisted or warped so I'm just doing a bit of preliminary planning on this that one looks pretty good one of the big problems with this wood is the grain is often very wavy and interlocked and it sort of doesn't matter which way you plant it, you're always going to be playing against the grain in one place or another. So I'm not going to go too overboard with trying to prepare this with the hand plane. That was just to get rid of the worst of the, uh, the waviness in it. And ideally you'd run this through a jointer first before we go on to the thicknesser, but like I say, don't have one. Now two of these pieces need to finish at 26 millimeters thick and the other piece needs to finish at 20. This is around about 29.5 at the moment. I'll put that surface that I just roughly planed on the table of the thicknesser. And we'll get these sort of run through on both sides, just get them roughly parallel and then we'll bring them down to a finished size. Uh, Makita thickness it does a pretty good job actually and it's a nice compact machine for my workshop which has a lot of machines and not a lot of space. So what we have now is two roughly parallel surfaces here. Well they should be pretty close actually. So I'm going to bring two of these down to 26, the other one to 20 and then we'll come back and break this down further. Well, they're completely finished on both sides now and there's very little tear out. Uh, what tear out I do have can be placed on the inside of the block frame. Now these pieces here are finishing at uh, 26.1 roughly and this one a little bit more oversized at 20.8. Now as it turns out this uh, material is going to be glued up into a square tube and then turn on the lathe to a finished diameter of 108 millimeters. So the actual thickness of these parts is slightly irrelevant really. Anyway, we'll get this uh, broken down further now and then we can make up our square tubes. I went ahead yesterday and glued these pieces together to make up one of these square tubes and it was just glued together with PVA and this hole in the centre here is essential, that's where all the electronics will go and I'll get the other one glued up now but the next step in this process is to put this on the wood layer and turn that into a complete cylinder. Now to make that a bit easier I made a template. Now this replicates what we see on the end of the stock there. So you can see that I've marked out the joints and I've marked four positions for wood screws and I wanted to be sure that if I screwed something on the end of this tube here that I wasn't going to expose those screws later when we turn this to a cylinder. And what we'll do is we'll screw uh, two pieces of wood, one to either end, and that will give us our centre. And we can go ahead and get this uh, turned. I'll do it on the wood lathe uh, to a very close uh, 108 diameter, and then we'll switch over to the metal lathe just to make sure it's truly cylindrical. 
So let me show you these little wood plates. So that's how that's going to work. So we're just going to wood screw those on the end of that stock there and we'll get it set up in the lathe. Now this is uh, not accurate on the end here so I'm going to cut this to length and try and get a, a truly accurate cut on that end. So let's get the other one glued together now. I'll just quickly show you the method that I use and then we'll move forward with this one here. It's one of the great things about making two clocks. <laughs> you can screw one up you can sort of show the good one on camera. Anyway, they're both going well so far. I've gone ahead and sanded all of the inside face of this stock so that uh, when it's glued together we're not going to be able to get at the inside. So I just want that to look tidy. Probably nobody's ever going to see it. <laughs> and the easiest way to do this is to just make yourself a hinge out of some tape. So put your stock together. You need to be sure that these joint faces are truly flat and accurate before you do this. So there's our tape hinge and you can just sort of hinge that open, get the glue in there, hinge it back again and get your clamps on. It won't all fall apart while you're trying to do this. While you've got a glue film in that joint there, this surface or these surfaces will want to skid around and you just got to adjust your clamps and slowly tighten everything up and just feel that that's level. And don't over tighten it either. If you squeeze all the glue out, <laughs> you've got nothing there to form the bond. So just moderate pressure is all you need. You see here I'm just doing the two short uh, sides first and before you let that set you want to be sure that this top surface is exactly right. If these sides are splayed out or in you want to correct that with a clamp or a wedge uh, before you let that glue set but that's pretty much perfect. You see that? <laughs> perfect. Before we can move on to the lathe, I need to get these ends dead flat and unfortunately my mitre saw isn't deep enough to be able to cut through that 108mm depth and even my table saw won't quite reach its way to the top. So I'll do the best I can with the blade up as far as it will go and then we'll just have to finish off with the plane. But I only want to just trim it up and that's all, not really cutting this to length. So this is the area that the saw blade couldn't get to. There's a slight depression there. You can see a little bit of glue there, but I'm not too bothered about that. Do need to get this off. So I'm just gonna very carefully take that off with the smoothing plane. camera's going to have to move. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. So we're going to screw these on now and get on the lathe. So these plates here are going to take the spur center at the headstock end of the wood lathe and the revolving center at the tailstock end. And I was very careful to work out where these screws were going to go so that they weren't exposed while we do the circular or cylindrical turning on this. So I've just uh, pre countersunk the holes and I'll just tap these screws in to mark their centers and we're going to pre-drill and then drill that piece on. And before I do that I'm going to get my spur center aligned with these diagonals and give that a good whack with a hammer to bed the spur center into this piece of stock. And that's going to drive the wood when we get on the wood lathe.
So these marks here are going to engage on the sharp edges on our spur centre and uh, tail stock pressure will keep it in there while we do the turning. Oh, so to stop on that first cut, the tip of the riving knife is getting caught uh, against this edge here, but fix that up. That's got most of that stock off now, so when we get on the wood lathe, we've got no sharp edges whizzing around. Okay, I've got this all set up, and I'm running the lathe at its second lowest speed. Problem with a job like this is that if you run at super high speed, which is good for removing stock, there's every chance that centrifugal force can pull the glue joints apart. So even though we've got these end plates on, we've got screws holding it together, I don't trust the glue joints. And all we want to do here is sort of get all the sharp edges off and get it almost cylindrical. So I'm going to be using a, a roughing gouge. I've got a face shield on. <laughs> and it's always a good idea when you're putting a job in a lathe for the first time to stand to one side when you switch the machine on. So don't be directly in line with the stock. Give yourself some room to the headstock end or the tailstock end, depending on where your start switch is. And if it all holds together, you just uh, hold your breath then and do the rest. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there. Um, we've got flats on three sides and this one here, is, the flat's almost gone. So it's not quite on centre. And our target dimension is 108, give or take a millimetre or so. But I think I'm going to move over to metal lathe now and we can be a bit more accurate about setting this up and getting the, uh, well, like measuring the diameter. So I'll just clean up this end and then we're heading to the metal lathe. All right, let's stop there. Now, well, here's the setup in the metal lathe, and I've got the spur center from the wood lathe set in the taper of the spindle. And I've got a round nose braised carbide tip tool. And I've just tried out uh, turning this end disc here. And I've got my caliper set to 108, and we're almost there, but uh, we've still got a bit of a flat. So I'm worried that when we come along here, we're still gonna have flats on this part. Now that 108 dimension uh, that I put on the drawing was just a figure I pulled out of the air. So if we go to 107 or 106, it's not that big a deal. I can make the end castings to suit. So let's run along at uh, the depth of cut I've got now and just see how we go. And I've got a sheet on the bed of the lathe here just to make cleanup easier. And it's all held down with magnets. It's clear of the feed screw and the lead screw, so we should be good. Well, there's a problem. Got a flat here and another one there. And another one here. So the whole job was skewed slightly. And that's the problem when you're trying to mark out in pencil on a square bit of wood or square-ish. Um, 
it's unlikely you're going to get it perfect. All right, we're just going to get rid of these flats. So it's probably going to wind up at 106. Okay, we're good around to here. Now we've got a little, tiny little flat there. And up this end. Yeah, tiny flat there. So let's just get a dimension on that now. Ah, well, will you look at that? <laughs> Still oversized. Not by much though. Yeah, 0.2 oversized. So I think I'll take another 0.5 off that. I think we should be good there. All right, well that came out at 107 instead of 108, and I've still got a tiny, tiny flat down here. But this can be made to be the back of the clock, and I can blend that. So I think we'll get away with that. And I'm going to take this next door into the wood shop now and I'll do the finish sanding on the wood lathe. Uh, this wood has a very, very fine dust and it gets in the back of your throat. It's, uh, it's quite unpleasant actually, but beautiful grain. So uh, let's take this out now and we'll move on. Oh, it's starting to clean up pretty good. If you're doing this on your wood lathe at home, always run your lathe on the lowest spindle speed. That way you won't overheat your abrasive paper. And if you have a reverse on your wood lathe, run it in reverse as well. And the reason for that is that if you're running your spindle the same direction all the time, the wood fibers tend to lay over in a particular direction. And if you can run it in reverse and then sand it again, it shears all those wood fibers off. But I'm not going to go too far with this now. Uh, we've still got a lot of work to do on it. It's going to get grubby and dirty and dented and marked and so on. So I'll probably sand this with the grain, uh, working with the sanding block uh, when we're close to finishing it. All right, so there's most of the clock case done. And what we need to do now is get on the CNC mill and create the window in the front and the back of the case and to do that I'll need to make a fixture and we're going to reference these flat surfaces on the inside of the case there to do that. Alrighty so what I've got is the job set up on the table of my little CNC milling machine. This is a SIG X3 that's been converted to CNC and what we need to be able to do is to fit this laser cut switch panel into the back of the clock. So if uh, I'll show you this laser cutting process later, but I made this one as a mock-up just to be sure that my tool path was correct. So, uh, let's have a closer look at how this is held down. So this is um, a piece of MDF which is bolted down to the milling machine table. I've got a piece of wood screwed down front and back and they have 45 degree edges. So this whole base assembly here replicates a V-block. Now the cylindrical job is sitting in there, it's supported on the two V's plus the bottom of this MDF plate and I've got a heavy piece of wood going all the way through from one end to the other and held down with toe clamps and that adds a bit of mass to the whole setup but it also allows me to check to make sure I've got this vertical edge truly square to this bottom plate here and that's going to be important when we turn this over later on. So I've got a 12.7mm Tungsten Carbide tip router bit uh, for, it's a wood router bit and it's held in a collet and I've zeroed the cutter out on the very center of the length and the width and I've got my Z height set to the top of the cylinder. Now we're running this at 2400 RPM, 400 millimeters a minute with a 4 millimeter, no 3 millimeter depth of cut. Now I could probably push it harder but I don't want to. This thing is not quite as rigid as you might think and uh, when it's got full contact and it goes around the corners it sort of does chatter a bit. So how do I know that? <laughs> because I've already done one. 
This is the second one and I wanted to be sure I had the tool path right before I showed you. Well, there you go, robots in the service of mankind. <laughs> and this is going to be held in later on with a wood screw at either end, like a round head screw. And there'll be three buttons on the back here, which control a version of the firmware that has a menu for setting up the clock. There's a separate switch here for showing dates and seconds. And I've got access to the USB port on the microcontroller if you ever want to reflash the clock. You don't have to sort of get it inside it. Alright, so now we've got to flip this over and do much the same thing on the front face. Turn this over now and we're going to do the pocket for the front screen. Slightly different order of operations though. All right, that went pretty well. I was a bit hair raising when this piece uh, dropped down. Managed to get through it okay. I'll get this out on the bench, give it a clean up, and we'll have a closer look. Right, here's one of the clock frames now, completely finished. I've given that a uh, sand all over the openings here, just to get rid of the burrs. This is the opening at the front where the clock screen will be visible. This is the back where the switch panel will be. 
You can see with this one here, I've actually pressed one of the clock modules in there at the moment. Now it's just a press fit. It will actually be held in place by a couple of wood screws at either end of these lugs here. And that will uh, allow the screen to be fixed in place and the clock module will be fixed to the back of the screen. Here's the other module ready to go in. But that's about as much as I've got time for today. It's, uh, it's nearly three o'clock, so the bell's about to ring. And I'm gonna invite you to come back for the next lesson, I mean, the next video. And we're gonna see some metal casting madness. Now these are the patterns for the base of the clock, or the pattern for the base of the clock. And this is one of two patterns for the end plates, which will support the whole clock on the base. So they're gonna be cast in aluminium. That's what we're doing in the next video. So come back and enjoy that. And uh, for today's video, we're done. Thanks for watching. I'll catch you on the next video. Preso, signing out.